take out the core and put something in the middle and put them in the oven and they turn into a complete foam, you know, they turn into very uh, fro frothy. I'm David Curtis, I was a film officer at the Arts Council in 1979. Now I'm a curator and writer about experimental film. I joined the Arts Council in 1977 and I said to the people who interviewed me that one of the things I wanted to do was to make exhibitions about film, which were, nobody was making exhibitions about film at that time. Uh, and it seemed a really interesting challenge to do. Filmmakers Co-op had started in London in 1966, so this is 10 years later. Uh, film was entering art schools at that time. From the early 70s uh, there had been film departments or uh, in many art colleges, so there was a beginning of, sort of a kind of broad movement in England. Um, the technology was difficult because there was no video at that time, or very little video. Um, so the question of how you would show moving images in a gallery was still a kind of big, big question mark. Uh, and one of the interesting things that Birgit Hein had done in Cologne is to get loop machines, loop absorbers, which were um, almost like, uh, they were disc players, almost like um, the, the film would be put on a disc behind the projector so it could be made into a loop and go round and round and round, so it could play continuously, even half an hour film could continuously play. And uh, we borrowed the loop absorbers that Birgit had used in Cologne, which I think were six or eight of them, and then we we bought some more. So we had, I think, 10 or 12 continuously running moving images in, in the exhibition. Uh, and that itself was, I think, the first time that any gallery had, had done that in England to, to show moving images in, in that way. Of course, there were a lot of still images next door to them. We, there were artist drawings that were related to the films. There were photographic blow-ups, there were stills from things. Uh, but we tried where possible to include moving images so that it would be a more lively exhibition. Um, and I think uh, I think we were very happy that it was a successful exhibition in terms of the way it, it looked. It did look quite wonderful. The uh, the the Hayward is on two levels, and um, we only had the lower level, so they were all um, dark spaces. There were no no, no daylight. Uh, and I think that worked for us very well because we basically we when when there were still images we illuminated them with very small spotlights so the the, the, light, the images were just glowing in the dark and then you would turn a corner and there would be a big screen with a moving image projected on it and the projector sitting in the background whirring away um, so it, it was a, it, I think the architecture there worked very well. I guess we could have proposed it for the Serpentine which was also run directly by the Arts Council at that time, uh, and obviously, I mean, there were many other galleries uh, around the country that one could have done it. But uh, um, we wanted a big space. I think we felt it needed to be a big exhibition to be in, uh, to have. Uh, we wanted to do a big catalogue as well, and uh, very few of the um, regional galleries were able at that time to afford a proper catalogue. Um, so obviously it was a kind of great advantage being within the art department that would, which ran the Hayward Gallery at that time. So it seemed the obvious thing to do, but it also, I think, the, the best thing to do. The interesting thing about the Hayward then was that I think it saw itself as having a mission to show um, work by uh, established British artists, but at different stages in their career. Mm -hmm. There would be sort of the equivalent of... Uh, uh, new, new artists that were like like young contemporaries, except that happened at the ICA. But there would be shows of of um, you know, surveying new movements in art. Then there would be kind of mid career retrospectives for established British artists, and then there'd be late career retrospectives as well. Now the Hayward is like everybody else wanted to do big international shows. So the Hayward, the Whitechapel, and the Royal Academy, they all do big contemporary international shows. Uh, and I think are much more directly linked to the art market 
um, in the international art market than, than they were in the 70s. I think there was a kind of greater freedom, funnily enough, in the 1970s to do um, interesting shows than, than there is now, perhaps. I don't, I must say that I think the way in which the South Bank has sort of disguised the brutalist architecture of, of the South Bank, I, I, I regret that enormously. The, the buildings are of their period, they're kind of important buildings of the brutalist sort, and the fact that they're all covered with um, official graffiti and uh, bits added on, you know, um, I think it's a great shame that they've they've hidden it. I hope one day it'll be restored back to its original state. You know, the, the 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 Hayward Gallery is not an ideal exhibition space, but I don't know that there is such a thing. But it, it's it's a very characterful space, and it can be used um, you know very effectively. I, I can you know there are lots of shows that have happened there which I thought were beautiful in the way that they were installed using the the strange architecture of the space, but uh, it's celebrating it rather than trying to hide it. Why did I fall in love with moving images? That's a really difficult one. I have thought a lot about that, and I don't have an answer really. I know that uh, you know I was brought up in Scotland, far away from um, any cinema. The uh, in the village that I lived in 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 the Highlands, uh, a man would turn up with a van with a projector in the back of it once every six months and show a film in the local village hall. And I remember seeing uh, some American musical or something like that with my parents in the 1950s in, in that village and being amazed by just color, sound, you know, movement. <laughs> Well, I'm Peter, Peter Avis, and one of the volunteers in the archive for the, since the beginning, for the last 10, 11 years or so, and a uh, bit of a musician on the, on the side, and uh, as I'm living through my own life again, going through all the archives of the Festival Hall, because I'm occupied in um, writing out all the in entries in the visitors' books that conductors and composers and musicians, um, pianists and so on, sign or write in when they've done their concert. They, some of them send best wishes to the hall or just say how much they've enjoyed it. And, um, and they just sign the, the book and that's kept as a record of who's been here over the years. The, um, this, is, this one is actually in sheets of paper. It's not been bound yet, but the um, older ones, the older ones are actually bound in this leather binding. And so they look really rather fine. Well, it, come, it came about originally when they wanted people, a lot of people, to type up memories that uh, audience members, not musicians, but audience members had of the hall since it opened. And so there were a group of about 15 of us ended up typing these things out. Um, a bit like Fiona does this at the moment, there's still uh, cards people fill in as they come to the hall on a daily basis uh, nowadays, and they all have to be typed up for the archive. And we started off with that and then gradually uh, we got other jobs and uh, the group of us that are now working have been um, actually looking at the archive and trying to catalogue it, preserve it and, um, and list it all and now put it onto the computer for digitisation. Some of the difficulties with these uh, visitors books is trying to actually read the writing, of the, read the signatures of the people. I do find it very satisfying to be able to relive my life because a lot of these concerts that I'm actually putting onto the computer I was at I've, uh, and sometimes I've sung in them in, com in a choir, sometimes I've been in the audience and um, so it's nice to be reminded of that. When, I mean I was a student in the old-fashioned days when, when, it, when one was sort of not much different from being an adult, it wasn't, there wasn't sort of such a gap between being a child and being an adult in those days I think but um, now I mean we notice now how differently the hall is used, the place is used. I'm very fond of it and it still seems to me to be a very modern looking building, um, certainly the concert hall inside and uh, it's a very 
comforting place and it's nice to know that the people who built it all the designers um, worked sort of together to make the whole thing a uni unity a unified place so all the d details of door handles and chairs and and various moldings on the wall all uh, all fitted in and the carpet particularly is a, is a iconic thing that's been replaced with a new one but it's the same design as last time after the renovation it's useful to have an archive per se, um, so that people can refer to it and do research um, on various projects. Um, it's, it's nice to have this room here, although it's very noisy and there's lots of other things going on, but because people can come in, they can be drawn in by the uh, adverts and things to see if there's anything they want to know of in their past. And um, once we've got more of it on the computer, it'd be easier for people to find what they want to know. I mean, we do already get requests from the public for what, what was the concerto played on a particular day. They remember coming to their birthday celebrations at the call and they remembered coming to a concert but they couldn't remember what the pieces were so they asked us and we can possibly find out. The, the four of us, the volunteers that we've, we, we're ended, we've ended up with at the moment, our sort of regular ones, because we've been coming say for so long, we've become very good friends and we, we do other things as well as come here. We, go, we give each other parties and things and go out to visit other places. We've been to museums and, and uh, other things together in groups, two or three of us. I hope it carries on being a very fine concert hall and isn't sort of turned into some sort of big uh, uh, community pop centre. No, I, I don't expect it will be, but there's, there's so much um, history here and so many orchestras over the world to play in London, so they've got to have a decent concert hall to come and play in, which is what we've got here. And uh, although other people want other concert halls, I think this South Bank one will last a long time. My name is Fiona, Fiona Eccles, and um, I've been working here like Peter for 10 years or so. Uh, I started here after retiring. I worked for a long time for the British Council, so promoting knowledge of Britain and its culture and education and language overseas. Well, when we first started, uh, I think as Peter mentioned, we were doing typing up memories of people who'd been at the Festival of Britain. And so that was, uh, I was just wanting to do some voluntary work. And it's really grown out of that. At the moment, I'm working on cataloguing the Lettings Diary for 1988, 89. And this is a diary in which everything was written down to do with the three concert halls, the Royal Festival Hall, the Queen Elizabeth Hall and the Purcell Room. And all the spaces in between, so lots of meeting spaces and bars where people had meetings. And it's all in this book and has to be written out. I mean, <laughs> when we were first here, well, the next job, after, after we typed up all the, the initial memories, we then did what I think we mentioned, which was box listing, which was just taking a big box and going through it and actually typing up with no reference to anything what we found in the box it's because everything had been put into boxes and people didn't really know what was there and in one of the boxes that I was uh, looking at the typing up we found the the mallet you know like a hammer a mallet and the um, ceremonial uh, spade for laying the foundation stone which is now in the archive and it's 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 silver the the mallet I can't remember the mallet has got very nice writing on it in its wood and then the the I can't remember what it's called the thing that you lay the plaster with it's uh, engraved in silver and it's uh, it's a lovely thing to see another thing that we found was a ballet shoe um, because they used to have the ballet was here every Christmas and uh, visiting ballet companies came from overseas particularly from places like Russia and of course in the old days with the Cold War it was very difficult to get um, exit permits for these people you know they had to come in a group they were very carefully shepherded everywhere and on one occasion I'm afraid I can't remember exactly the dates but one of the ballet dancers defected when she was here and she left she just ran I mean she just left stuff left her ballet shoes left and ran well <laughs>
So that was an interesting thing to find. The South Bank Centre, I mean, I have always liked coming to. I wasn't brought up in London, but when I came down to London, um, I used to come to concerts here and it was a nice place to come to. I used to go to the Hayward exhibitions at the Hayward Gallery quite a lot. Well, it's become much more, um, much more of a community centre in the last few years, insofar as people come in here, uh, a lot of them use it as their office, it seems, you know, because they can get free Wi-Fi. Um, they, so they spend a lot of time, you, see, you come across people having meetings here, which are nothing to do, I suspect, with the actual centre, but it's a nice, warm, dry place to come. Free electricity, free heating. Um, there are lots of mothers who come in with children, which I think, although it's very noisy, it's actually very nice because if you're a single, not a single mother, but if you're a mother at home, it's nice to be able to come in and meet other mothers and there's space for your children to come and run around. Um, one of the memories that we were typing up when we were doing the memories, and this is to do with the way back in 1951 at the festival, it was from people who lived in quite a, a, a poor part of London and they lived in a flat and they had never climbed, they'd never been in stairs, you know, they'd been, they'd never been anywhere with carpeted stairs before. So I hope that some of the children now, although they're running around enjoying themselves, are also getting a memory of architecture and the space that they're in, which unconsciously might be going into them. Um, we do come across things that people sort of complain about, but they complain more about the interior than the exterior, uh, if they complain. I mean, a lot of the people are actually just saying how wonderful it is to be here. So uh, people have to be very upset to actually complain. You know, they, they really have to be, and then they don't necessarily, it's not something that we necessarily come across um, because they maybe wrote to the managing director and said, I do not like this. Um, Certainly, I mean, the concrete of the, of the Queen Elizabeth Hall and the Hayward Gallery, um, it, it is still quite hard in the way its appearance, although it fits in with the, uh, the National Theatre, the other side of the bridge. Um, and of its time, it's a very, very good example. And it's actually, it's, a lot of money was spent on it because the way that the concrete is um, cast on all of that, they have left in the marking of the wooden boards where they held the co where the concrete was poured in and left it as a sort of mark. So, again, people may not like it, but it was innovative for the time and um, probably cost far more than it would have done if they just stuffed up slab concrete like they could have done. A lot of the work that was that had to be done post-war, so through the 50s, I think um, people were becoming better off. Um, work was sort of stabilising, housing was better, people were feeling more comfortable in themselves and so I think they had an idea to sort of maybe all this old stuff was a bit old and uh, we want to do something different. I mean Certainly when I was a girl, which was during that time, you dressed like your mother, you know. Um, there, wasn't, there, wasn't teenage, there weren't teenage clothes. That, they did come in when I was at school, but um, we tended to look much older than we were. Well, it, it's a, many cities now have um, a cultural area, and I suppose this could be the London cultural area. I mean, there are more places now with places opening up in the East End and um, places that didn't used to be so cultural. Um, but this is the premier one. This is the one that you come to. And of course, it's because it's near all the other attractions like the House of Parliament. It's next to the river. It's next to the theatres. Um, people go on cruises up and down the river. So from that point of view, it's very well placed. <laughs>